three, the rule of law and representative government. An optimal system of social and political order emerged in the English-speaking world based on private property rights and the representation of property owners in elected legislatures. This was quite different from the systems of law that had evolved elsewhere, in which individual rights were given short shrift. Since he said two different things, it's best we uh, just go through both of them. First of all, representative government is not in invented by the Westerners, and that was acknowledged by the Westerners who you claim invented it. And I will show you just now, democracy, which is what he's alluding to, is not a Western invention. Not, it, and it's not a uniquely Western invention. Other places in the world had democracies. But in order to prove this, we'd have to look at the information. Thomas Jefferson's notes of the state of Virginia. Yes, that Thomas Jefferson wrote about the nations of Indians that had groupings and democracy. Unlike some people he mentioned more than one, mentioning at least three nations in Native American populations. The first were the Mingos, or Iroquois, the second were the Powhatans, and the third were the Delaware. These three large council groups are described in detail, but he was only aware of their wearing, warring efforts and so he missed out on the other details that come with the rest of the nation. And he said, It is true that when at home they do not employ themselves in labor or the culture of the soil, but this again is the effect of their customs and manners, which have assigned that to the province of the woman. But it is said they are averse to society and a social life. Can anything be more inapplicable than this to a people who always live in towns or clans? Or can they be said to have no republic who conduct all their affairs in national councils, who pride themselves in their national character? who consider an insult or injury done to an individual by a stranger as done to the whole, and resent it accordingly. In short, this picture is not applicable to any nation of Indians I have ever known or heard of in North America. As far as I have been able to learn, the country from the sea coast to the Allegheny and from the most southern waters of James River up to Portacus River, now in the state of Maryland, was occupied by three different nations of Indians, each of which spoke a different language and were under separate and distinct governments. Their government is a kind of patriarchal confederacy. Every town or family has a chief who is distinguished by a particular title and whom we commonly call Sachem. The several towns or families that compose a tribe have a chief who presides over it, and the several tribes compassing a nation have a chief who presides over the whole nation. These chiefs are generally men advanced in years and distinguished by their prudence and abilities in council. The matters which merely regard a town or family are settled by the chief and principal men of the town. Those which regard a tribe, such as the appointment of head warriors or captains, and settling differences between different towns and families are regulated at a meeting or council of the chiefs from the several towns. And those which regard the whole nation, such as the making of war, conclude peace or forming alliances, with the neighboring nations are deliberated on the determined in a national council composed of the chiefs of the tribe, attended by the head warriors and a number of the chiefs from the towns who are his counselors. In every town there is a council house where the chief and old men 
of the town assemble. When occasion acquires and consult what is proper to be done, every tribe has a fixed place for the chiefs of the towns to meet and consult on the business of the tribe. And in every nation, there is what they call the central council house or the central council fire, where the chiefs of the several tribes with the principal warriors convene to consult and determine on their national affairs. When any matter is proposed in the national council, it is common for the chiefs of the several tribes to consult thereon part with their counselors, and when they have agreed to deliver the opinion of the tribe at the national council, and as their government seems to rest wholly on persuasion, they endeavor by mutual consensus to obtain unanimity. Such is the government that still subsists among the Indian nations bordering upon the United States. Some historians seem to think that the dignity of office of Sakam was hereditary, but the, that opinion does not appear to be well founded. The Sakam or chief of the tribe seems to be by election and sometimes persons who are strangers and adopted into the tribe are promoted to this dignity on account of their ability. The evidence we have that they existed is the 1400s, meaning that these people predate the European states and the European democracy by hundreds of years. This cooperation will soon become one of the largest in history. The Iroquois had five nations, and the five nations were the Mohawk, the Onienda, the Onondaga, Cayuga, and Seneca. And their territory expanded from New York all the way to Canada. So how did the system work? Well, first, we start with the clan mother. Because the Iroquois were very matriarchal, meaning that when a man got married to a woman, he would be said to move to the female's family instead of the woman moving to the man's family. But this clan mother was not just a random person. She was appointed with a duty of selecting a representative for her clan. And then they would join together and these clans would go into the nation and these nations would go into the bigger nation and be represented. If the queen mothers felt that the chief they chose was not fit for the job, they would have the right to fire him. Of course, this would force the chief to act in the interest of his people. More than this, there was councils with the clan mother in which the individual individuals of the state or the clan would voice their opinions or their options to the clan mother, discussing things like taxes, warfare, and so much more, all operations in the nation. And the clan mother would make this known to the chief, and the chief would therefore discuss it and try to reach harmony or unity or the better word is consensus between all the other clans on what to do. Now the clans did do some things independently, like conquer tribes outside, but for the most part, this is how the system worked. Unlike a lot of systems around the world, this was not based on nepotism. Instead, it was based on the abilities of the people, or it was a meritocracy. And so the queen mother would watch children, the young boys, and see which one of them had good qualities and that's how they would choose them. Now you're probably thinking, oh, so they had six chiefs. No, they had 50 chiefs in the 1600s that represented the Iroquois. And so these 50 chiefs would have to reach consensus for what to do for the nation. In other words, they had 50 mothers, nation mothers. There's also an interesting feature, which is a person could not fornicate with someone of the same clan, but instead had to find someone outside of their clan. But I don't know if that was always followed. This alone would make this a democracy, but this isn't the only feature that made it a democracy. See, there were council meetings held before the chiefs were about to make a decision. These council meetings would be separated by gender. There'd be females and there'd be a male council meeting and they'd ruminate in these council meetings. And when I say females, I mean most of the females of the nation would get together and ruminate over the ideas and then most of the men would ruminate over the ideas. When they've come to a conclusion, then they would send the males to go fetch the answer from the females and then run back to the males and say what their conclusion was. And this 
is a second feature of democracy in which they can veto ideas though these councils could be thought of as a council of elders children's voices were not left out of the conversation and just like any adult they could voice their opinion now the iroquois had another feature that would make this democratic in that they had selection of something called faith keepers and other positions in the clan that had little to do with the state like ceremonies and stuff like that that would be elected on and thought about through council meetings this meaning that their expansion of democracy was bigger than just the state now this is the original united states of america now i want to state that quite clearly the systems of these indians were not just something they looked at and went hmm but instead they mimicked some of these ideas in their own systems and if you look at how the rule or democracy works in america you can see that it's closer to this iroquois one than it is to the ancient greek version where people voted more on laws than they did on their leaders.